Hi, hello and welcome. Are you looking for a movie review channel with a difference? Because if you are, you've come to the right place. I'm Jim Black from the Three Hats Stage Media Channel and this is an edition of Pause for Thought, where I take a look at one of my favourite movies and see what messages we can take from it and how we can use those insights into today's busy lives. I also look at the cast, who's in it, what characters they play and what they've been in before. I look at the facts and the fiction and I also look at the trivia, but that's not right till the end. So please stay with me. So let's get right into this review and find out more. So what movie have I got for you today? Well, as you can see from the light box just to my side, it's The Goldfinch from 2019. It's adapted from the novel by Donna Tartt, and she won the Pulitzer Prize for it, for fiction, in 2014. She's also responsible for The Little Friend and The Secret History. Peter Strawn adapted it for the screen, and he was responsible for Men That Stare at Goats, starring George Clooney and Ewan McGregor, as well as Tinker Taylor, Soldier Spy, from the book by John le Carre, and that starred Colin Firth, Gary Oldman, and Toby Jones, to name three. He also adapted the book by Joe Nesbo, The Snowman. And apparently, if you see a snowman with a scarf, you should always take care. Apparently, there's a double cast in this movie. One to represent the past and one to represent the future. So let's find out who's in it. You've got Ansel Elgort. He plays the older version of Theo Decker, and he's been in Baby Driver, Billionaire Boys Club, and one of our favourite movies, A Fault in Our Stars. I'm going to do a review of it on this channel at some time in the future, but I warn you now, it's quite a sad movie. You've got Oakes Fegley. He plays the younger version of Theo Decker, and he was in Broadwalk Empire, as well as Pete in Pete's Dragon. You've got Nicole Kidman. She plays Mrs Barber. And she's been in so many of my favourite movies. The Others, Moulin Rouge, Golden Compass. She was also in Australia, that epic movie that takes you about three days to watch. But I exaggerate there slightly. You've got Jeffrey Wright. He plays Hobie. And if you're a James Bond fan, you'll know him as Felix Dexter, the CIA agent from Casino Royale and A Quantum of Solace. And he was also in Broadwalk Empire which is a TV series which I must watch someday soon. You've got a newer in Barnard. He plays the older version of Boris. Now he was in Dunkirk as well as War and Peace. You've got Finn Wolfhard. He plays the younger version of Boris. And if you watch Stranger Things, you'll know him from that. There's Ashley Cummings. She plays the older version of Pippa. And you may know her from Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries as well as Home and Away. All the members of the cast are Amy Lawrence, Luke Wilson, Sarah Paulson and Willa Fitzgerald, to name but a few. And I can't do all their back history. You'll have to find out that for yourself. So I ask, is it right? Could you cope with a major life event? And how would you if one happened to you? And doesn't time heal all wounds and make things right in the end? Let's get into this movie review and find out. We can all have major life events that happen to us just like that and turn our worlds upside down. But what would we do and how would we cope with them? Those around us are always having life events, some small, some big. And most people just get on with life and see where it takes them. But that's the difficulty, isn't it? It's the doubt, it's the uncertainty, the change that's gonna happen and there's nothing you can do about it. Does time heal the wounds? And will it end up where we want it to be? But that's for us and the people around us to help us understand. We're going to follow the two Theo Deckers, the younger one through to the older one. We're going to see the major life event that happens to young Theo and how he copes with it and the people he meets and the influences he gets and the journey that he then goes on. So let's follow both their stories through the movie 
and find out what's going to happen as we take a look at the plot. So this is another great story and definitely one of my favourites. Anything that twists and turns from past to present and back again is always on that list. It starts in a hotel room in Amsterdam, somewhere near Christmas time because there's snow falling outside. We find Theo Decker, the older version, contemplating ending his life. But why is he doing that? We just don't know at this point. All he tells us in his narration is that it's all to do with that painting. But he also tells us it's the first time he's heard his mum's voice in many, many years. We then move back in time to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. We find the young Theo with his mum. They're standing next to a young girl and an older gentleman. The girl's about Theo's age and the gentleman probably the young girl's uncle or maybe grandfather. But we don't know that at this point. The next thing we find is that Theo is walking out of the museum, covered in dust. He's walking through the debris and the devastation that's been caused by a massive explosion. He's on his own. He goes back to his apartment and waits for his mum to return because he can't find her. Then we're in the hallway of a very exclusive New York City apartment. We're at the home of the barbers and we find two policemen and a social worker talking to Mrs. Barber with Theo sitting on a chair waiting. He's told the police and the social workers that maybe Mrs. Barber will look after him because he goes to school with her son, Andy. Mrs. Barber agrees to take him in. And although it's difficult for him, he has nightmares, he doesn't know where he is, and he doesn't know really where he's going. At one point, he's questioned by the FBI because they want to get to the bottom of what happened at the bombing. They pound him with questions, but Mrs. Barber's not very happy with it. So she stops the interview. When they get home from the FBI meeting, Mrs. Barber is kind and understanding. She's helping guide Theo through this very difficult time. She suggests that they go back to his apartment and get some things to make him feel happier and also that he should go back to school. They go back to the apartment, they find some things and the painting is there in a bag. But Theo doesn't take it. He decides to leave it there because it's the best place for it. Back at school, things are trying to get back to normal and there's an older boy who's supposedly Theo's friend but he stitched him up and told the headmaster that they weren't his cigarettes, they were Theo's. And Theo's a little bit cross about this because obviously they weren't. Theo decides to take the ring back to Hobart and Blackwell as he was told to do so when he was given it back in the Museum of Art. He makes his way through New York City and finds the antique shop or renovators of antiques, Hobart and Blackwell. Nobody answers the door so he goes round the back and rings the green doorbell. The door opens and there stands Hobie. He invites him in when Theo shows him the ring. He's puzzled as to where the ring has come from and how Theo would have it. But then he realises that you're that boy. You're one of the survivors. He takes him in, up the stairs, into the kitchen, and he asks him if he's hungry. They chat, they start to form a bond, and Theo gets a toasted cheese sandwich. Now I'm going to digress slightly here. I would have a cheese sandwich toasted if I could right at this moment. But I'm doing this film review, so that'll have to wait till later. Hobie tells Theo that the man that gave him the ring was Welty, his business partner, a part of Hobart and Blackwell. And Welty's niece, Pippa, had not been killed. She'd been hurt pretty badly, and she was asleep in the bedroom at the antiques place. Theo wants to see her, so Hobie agrees and takes him to her room. He leaves them two alone, and they start to chat. Pippa tells Theo she sometimes gets very tired and she may fall asleep. She's not being rude. It's a part of what happened when the explosion went off. Theo is okay with that. And she says, what's your favourite music? He says Beethoven. And she says, well, listen to my iPod if I do fall asleep. As she falls asleep, he puts the iPod earphones into his ears and presses play. Beethoven is playing. And the piece of music is the Piano Concerto Number no. 5, Opus 73, Number no. 2. It's Agio, Poco, Un Musso. And for those of you that don't know, that's the Emperor Concerto. It was written in 1909 in Vienna in Austria about Archduke Rudolf. And it's being performed 
by Glenn Gould. And that's a little bit of trivia before the end. Theo gets some new glasses, which makes him look a little bit like Harry Potter. He also starts to form more of a bond with Pippa and Hobie. He goes to visit him at the shop quite regularly, and Hobie starts to teach him about the restoration of antiques. How you can take from one piece, put it on another piece to make it new again, but never sell it as something that it shouldn't be, because that's just not done in the antiques world. Theo agrees that he would never do that, and he starts to get into all the types of veneers, the finials, the feet, the doors, the handles, and all that sort of thing, which is very fascinating for anybody that likes antiques in that way. Now you might think that everything's going really well, but when you've just lost your mum in a major explosion, how can that be possible? You've got to make do with what you've got and the life changes that that's brought. Now Theo hasn't seen his dad in many a year, but things are going to change because his dad turns up, he's been out in Las Vegas, he's a drunk, alcoholic even, and he does a lot of gambling. His lady friend is called Sandra, and she works in a bar somewhere on the Vegas Strip, and they've come to take Theo away. Theo's not very happy with this, because he's really happy where he is with the barbers, up to the point where they really like him, and maybe they were just going to adopt him at that point. There's a little journey here back into present day, and we find the older version of Theo, very smartly dressed, three-piece suit, and he's now the business partner of Hobie. But you'll find out why in a little bit. Pippa's there, she's with her boyfriend from England, because she doesn't like New York City, obviously, because of the explosion. Although she's just about to head back, Theo can't go with them to lunch because he's got an important meeting with a client that they've got. And this is where we meet Lucius Reeve for the first time. He tells Theo he knows all about him. He knows that he's fixing pieces of furniture and selling them as the originals. But what's going to go wrong there? He demands that something must be done. Theo offers him more money, but it's not enough. Lucius doesn't know what he wants at this point, but again, something else we'll find out later in the movie. After this really bad meeting between Lucius and Theo, Theo's walking along the New York street and he bumps into Blatt. Now Blatt's the older brother of Andy from the Barber family. They talk and they find out that Andy and his dad and Blatt went on a sailing out into the sea and there was a big storm and Andy and his dad were killed. Theo's very sad about this, but he agrees with Blatt that he will go and see Mrs. Barber again. So we go back to the very exclusive New York apartment where they're all reunited. And this is where Theo meets Kitsy again, who was the younger sister of Andy. I hope you're following this because it does get quite confusing at times. If you ever watch this movie and listen to the review first, then please drop a comment below and tell me how accurate I was and if you thought it was any good. Sorry, digressing again. So we now head back to the apartment in New York City with the younger Theo and his dad and Zandra. He tells him to pick up some stuff because they're heading out to Vegas straight away. Theo gets the painting, which is the most important thing, and a few of his bits, and off they go to Vegas. In Vegas, we find that they're living in one of these estates that's not quite there. And in that, I mean, it's all been repossessed and most of the houses are empty. All the swimming pools are filled with sand because Nevada is out in the desert. Just in case you didn't know, of course. Anyway, it's a quite different place to what Theo has been used to. And what will happen next? Well, let's see, shall we? Theo starts a new school in Las Vegas, and this is where he meets Boris. He's going to become a lifelong friend, and they're going to build a relationship built on difficulties that they're both going through. And hopefully the future will be bright for everybody. There's a great scene here where they get off the school bus at the end of the school day, and they're walking towards Boris's house. The music that goes with this segue is Your Silent Face by New Order. Now they play probably about two minutes of it, and it is a great track. And I suggest, after this of course, you go to a streaming service and download everything that New Order did, because they're just a great band with some great tracks. There's tragedy in that band, but that's a story for another day. The boys talk about life, and situations of who they are and how they've got to where they are. And then the movie moves on yet again. So we now find ourselves at Thanksgiving. It's obviously a big thing in America. It happens in November and it's celebrated with turkey and celebrations. 
and it's all about family and friends being together. Theo gets invited by his dad to go out to lunch with them, or dinner even, but Zandra doesn't really want that. Theo makes the excuse and tells Zandra and his dad that him and Boris are going to have Thanksgiving together. You can have some food and watch some TV. Later that evening, when the house is quiet and there's just the two boys, there's more alcohol, there's some drug abuse from experimental purposes, and there's some things going on that shouldn't possibly be going on in the lives of these two young boys. But Boris is in a very difficult position, the same as Theo. Lives have been changed. Boris's dad is a bully. He beats him. He moves him around all the time because of his job. He takes it out on Boris and Boris suffers for it. Theo is very similar because he's been yanked out of life time and time again. Always something changing and never anything settled. The drugs kick in and there's a flashback here to the day of the explosion at the Metropolitan Museum for Art. We find Theo wandering through the dust and the debris. There's paintings blown off the wall, there's bricks and mortar everywhere, there's dead bodies, and there's clothes and handbags strewn everywhere. It's pure devastation. Theo stumbles across an old man that's still alive. He begins to chat to him. He tells him that there's a painting just over there on the floor that needs to be taken care of. There's a big story with this painting. It's traveled through time and it must be saved at all costs. Theo agrees to take it. It's the goldfinch and it's also a representation of something that always comes out of something bad. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that shortly. He also gives him a ring and tells him to ring the doorbell, the green one, and give the ring to Hobie. We already saw this a little bit earlier in the movie, but I'm just telling you so I can fill in the blanks. A few days later, we find Theo and his dad talking in the living room while his dad's watching sport. He's obviously gambling on the football or the hockey or whatever it is that people gamble on. And Theo's chattering away to him. He tells him that he's going to put £10,000 or dollars, if you're American, into an account because he feels that Theo should have something to live for later. His dad says all he needs is his social security number. And then he can make the payment into the account so that Theo is set up for life. Sounds good, doesn't it? But will it be? Who knows? On another day, Theo's dad comes home. He's very anxious. He's very upset. He tells Theo that he's got to make a phone call to his mum's attorney to get some money that's been left in trust for him. He needs $65,000 for a business venture and he needs it now. Theo's got to ring this person up and tell him that he wants the money transferred to this particular account. Now, why would he want to do that? It upsets Theo very much. His dad begins to slap him around the face and that's not a good thing to do. It upsets him to make him cry. His dad tells him to pull it together and make the phone call. When he's making a phone call, his attorney says, there's somebody been trying to get into your account. They've got your social security number and Theo realizes that his dad's a fraud. Although he's not really. He's got himself into some difficulties and he can't get out of it. It happens to many of us and we shouldn't just look at it and judge it. Every situation is different and we need to give people time and understanding sometimes. Anyway, Theo runs out of the house and meets up with Boris. This is where we take some more drugs. It's involved in the movie, so it's got to be talked about. It's the only escape they've got. It gives them hallucinations that can take them out of this world. And we all have relief in different ways. And drugs is just a representation of how it's done in this particular movie. They head back to the house, only to find Zandra and two of her friends are very upset. And Zandra tells Theo that his dad has been killed in a car accident. So he's orphaned yet again. But because of the drugs and the way he's making him feel, he doesn't quite comprehend any of it. But later that evening, he decides that he's got to get out. Because if he doesn't, he'll be put into some sort of care system and that's not great for him. So he tries to get some money together so they can go. He wants Boris to go with him, but Boris doesn't want to go. He wants him to stay because he's got something important to tell him, but he can't tell him until another day. They've got this very strong bond and Boris tells Theo that he will come out in a few days time. So the next thing we see is Theo on a bus journey across America. He's got his belongings, he's got his painting, and he's got the dog, because Sandra didn't like it. He's got a little bit of money, 
and hopefully when he gets to New York City, things will work out. But we don't know that at this point in the movie. We just know that he's heading away and he's got to get to New York because that's where he was happy. This movie has some great music in it. And for this particular segue on the bus from one part of the country to the next, they use It's All Over Now, Baby Blue. Now, many of you will think that that's a Bob Dylan song and you'd be right. But in this case, it's done by Van Morrison when he was in the band then. And what a great version. Again, I suggest anything by Bob Dylan or Van Morrison, you stream later. Back in New York City, Theo goes to see Hobie. He rings the bell, it's raining, it's a very moving part of the movie. He goes in and Hobie takes him in, and the dog. And he says he doesn't have to go ever again. Back in present day, there's a meeting between Lucius Reeve and Theo. Lucius now knows what he wants. He's put it all together and he knows that Theo was the person in the museum that must have taken a goldfinch picture. It's the only thing possible. The picture was there before the explosion and the picture wasn't there after the explosion. And Theo is the only survivor that could have been near that picture because he was in the room 32 that the picture was hung in. Now Theo denies all knowledge of this and he storms out. Now at this point I need to tell you that Theo and Kitsy are now engaged to be married. So Theo's off to go and see her because he wants to talk to her about it. She's not there, so off he walks down the street. He sees two figures coming towards him and it's Kitsy and Tom. Tom being the boy that got him into trouble about the cigarettes all those years ago. Kitsy and Tom are kissing and cuddling and that's not good because they're not supposed to be because Theo is engaged to be married to Kitsy. What's going on here? They don't see him because he hides. And the next thing we find is him having it out with Kitsy. They both agree mutually that things must carry on as they are because it's good for both of them. An image is everything. The next thing we find, Theo needs some more drugs. He's not lost his habit, and that was all down to Boris, if you remember. He hasn't got any, so off he goes to try and find some in a local bar. He's been told that there's some for sale if he asks for a certain barmaid. The bar people say, that's not possible. She doesn't exist. So he goes out very quickly. Now this is the point where a character runs out after him. And the character shouts down the street, Potter. And when Theo turns around, yes, it's the older version of Boris. They get together, they have a chat, they have some drinks. And Theo finds out all about Boris. And Boris finds out all about Theo. Boris has done quite well. He's even got a car with a driver. And off they go to try and find some food. But this is the point where Boris is going to tell Theo what he wanted to tell him all those years ago. And the reason why he never followed him to New York City at that time. He tells him that the Goldfinch painting was taken by him because he wanted it to raise some money. And Theo has not known about this all the years because it's still in the bag and he never looks at it. He goes to the lockup and finds out that it's not there. And now life is really confused and upsetting for him because the painting is actually something that's relied on as a thing linking the past, the last thing probably that him and his mum looked at together. So we're now at the wedding breakfast. It's one of them things that they have. It's not actually the wedding day. It's probably a few days before. It's where everybody gathers and dresses up nicely and they drink wine and eat, I suppose. Kits is there, obviously, and Theo and Mrs. Barber and Blatt and all the friends and family of both of them. But Boris turns up. And if you remember, Theo's pretty upset with him at this point. Boris tells Theo that they must get on a plane now and fly to Amsterdam if he wants the picture back. He agrees, he tells Kitsy, and off they go. We're now in Amsterdam, and we're going to try and get the picture back. Now this is where it gets confusing yet again. But it might be my descriptions, but just bear with me. So what happens is, they meet up with some gangsters who've got the picture. There's a gunfight, they get the picture. They meet up with some more gangsters, and there's a gunfight. And the picture is taken by somebody who runs off with it. So the painting's been lost yet again. What could possibly go wrong now? I ask you. But if you've read the book or seen this movie before, you'll know. But I'm glad you're still with me at this point. The spoiler alarms are now going off 
And I can't tell you anymore because I never do. I mean, it's a spoiler alarm. So it would spoil it, wouldn't it, if I told you? And then you'd know what happens in the film. And I really suggest you either go out and buy the book or go and see the movie. So let's sum it all up. What will happen next? You've got Theo. He wants to be with Pippa, but can't be. You've got Kitsy, who's probably going to be with Tom. You've got Boris, who wants to be the friend of Theo. And you've got Hobie, who's fell out with Theo. And those two should be friends forever. After all, they've gone through so much. There's the barbers. What will happen to them? And what will happen to the painting? Where is it? And will it ever end up back at home? All things to be answered if you watch the movie. All I can say is that the end of a story is always the beginning of a new one. And if you remember at the start of this movie, Theo was not feeling the best. He was about to take a concoction of drugs and alcohol and put an end to his life because that's all he could find to do. He couldn't see a way out. Now I'm not going to tell you what happens, whether it's a happy or sad ending. You're going to have to watch the movie, like I said. All I can say is that major life events are there to test us out. They happen each and every day. Sometimes we don't even know they're happening. But can we get through them? Yes, we can. But every day, challenge yourself to be better. Take each and every day as it happens. Stand back every now and again and have a look. It'll give you a better view of what's going on. So now let's look at the trivia for this movie. Oakes Fegley plays the young Theo. He also played Pete in Pete's Dragon, as I told you earlier. Now in Pete's Dragon, he's adopted by a family. And the daughter of that family is Una Lawrence. Now the family that was going to adopt him in this movie, if you remember, was the Barbers. And the actress that was the little girl that played the younger version of Kitsy was Amy Lawrence, the sister of Una. A little bit of useless information that, but I still think it's good. And it means that Oakes has played with the two sisters in two families that he was possibly going to be included in. The next thing I've got for you is the actor that plays Andy. I've not mentioned him a lot in the review, because if you remember, he only appeared in the start of it. But he's played by Ryan Foost. Now he's an accomplished actor on his own. How can that be? He's only 14. He's appeared over 200 appearances on Broadway as Charlie Bucket in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. That's not bad for a 14 year old, I think. The painting used in the movie, The Goldfinch, was painted in 1654 by Fabritius. And I hope I've said that right, but apologies if I haven't. But it's got a story of where it survived over 400 years. And all it is is a bit of paint on some board. Not bad for a painting that age to still look so good. And it hangs in The Hague if you ever want to go and see it. In the book, The Goldfinch, you'll find that Boris, the young Boris, when asked his name, he refers to himself as Prince Boris. You know, like the one in War and Peace. Now this is the best bit of trivia that I've got for this movie. And Urien Barnard also appeared in War and Peace, as I told you earlier. And guess who he played? He played Prince Boris. Isn't that great? The music is really great too. You've got Bach, you've got Brahms, you've got Beethoven, as I said. And a lot of the pieces in this movie are performed by Glenn Gould, the world famous pianist. You've also got Rosemary Clooney. You've got Them, you've got New Order, and you've also got Radiohead. So what a great soundtrack if you ever want to download it. I hope you've enjoyed this movie review. If you want to know where my thoughts and inspirations come from, please click on one of the links in the bio below and they'll take you for a closer look. If you want to subscribe to my channel, please do so by striking the button. And if you want to know when the next one's uploaded, hit that bell. If you want to give me a thumbs up, I'd appreciate that too, as it shows that I'm doing the right thing. And if you want to leave a comment, I will always get back to you, as and when I can. And I've been Jim Black for the Three Hats Stage Media channel, for this edition of Pause for Thought. I hope to see you again soon.